I'm Dean Foley, a proud Camillory man, and this is the Indigipreneur Podcast. So to start things off, and guy, why am I Dean? Um, could you please share a bit about your background and what led you down the path of entrepreneurship and starting your own business? Uh, it's something I was keen about as a, as a child. You know, I was looking at businesses I wanted uh, to do, what sort of career I wanted to have. So, so I was keen about you know uh, uh, startups and that. And then also um, uh, when I looked at the indigenous space, I realised that there's a missing link there, and a missing link is economic development. And to do that, you, know, you have to do it through uh, good commercial profit-making businesses, which really uh, sets us up for self-determination. So those two coming together, uh, I've been looking at this space now for 30 years, uh, and then uh, you know in the last um, you know 15 years doing my own thing. Awesome. And um, tell us a bit more about your business and how did you get the idea or concept, and how's it all progressing? Well, it started out um, uh, really as uh, filling a gap, and the gap we started out doing is in the consulting space about how we work with um, uh, large mining and, and energy industries, because energy is my background, I come out of the, the gas industry, uh, about how we can get them working with uh, Indigenous groups and also building the capacity for Indigenous groups to to uh, run their own businesses and to uh, start being able to be competitive and commercial. Uh, so that's what we started from. We're actually going a bit further than that now. We still do a bit of consulting, uh, but the, the main part of our work now is actually uh, uh, working with startups. So, for instance, uh, we looked at the idea after the, after the commodity prices went down in the mining industry of a number of Indigenous people were coming off, losing their jobs because of that. Uh, downturn. So we, we looked at the idea of uh, mining re- rehabilitation, regeneration, and because that work still w- had to be done, and so we, we set up a, uh, a company uh, working with uh, traditional owner groups to uh, and people coming off the mining industry. So doing that, so it's filling a gap. So that's becoming really good at the moment, starting to grow. In fact, uh, we started that two years ago. So, so having ownership and management of those type of companies and also now we're um, pushing into the, uh, uh, from that going into the construction phase because if you can do rehab work, you know, driving heavy machinery on a mine site, you can do it in infrastructure, building roads and stuff. So we're slowly moving through into that post, uh, part and over the next two years there'll be a, a big growth area for us. And what have you personally learned from running a successful business and the, and the key fundamentals to make it successful? Well, it's it's really a, it's about um, uh, courage. I call it. You know, so you, you look. I sat there and talked about it like many people. You talk about these ideas and you have this wish list of what you want to do. Uh, it's really about just do it. Just just go up there and have a go. And and uh, so things I learnt, uh, you know, was okay. If I'm going to run a business, I have to learn how to run businesses. So I went deliberately uh, into the private sector and worked for. Uh, companies, private sector companies, and, and, and learn a skill base about how they do things, how they do their contracting, how they, how, how they, how, how they operate, how do, you, how do you make sure that you uh, did some financial courses and that as well, to making sure that, you know, when, when I get uh, $10, I've got to make sure I've got to put some of that money aside for tax, plus put some money aside for the growth of the company you know, and don't just go out and have a party. Uh, so those type of, you know, very... Uh, ordinary things that business has to do. And also the other important thing uh, is building networks. Um, you know, I'm at the stage now that I don't really go out looking for contracts now. It's about uh, people coming to us and saying, OK, we, uh, we heard about you, we like you, what you're doing, and we'd like to work with you, isn't that? So it's about... So, so it's, in networking, is very important. So I've built up over, you know, 30 years, 40 years, uh, a number of networks, political, uh, private, uh, business, uh, right across the country. So, and uh, and at state, territory, and federal levels, international levels. I've, I've been to China a few times, building uh, networks and uh, uh, contacts there, as as well as in Indi- India and other places. So, so 
uh, it's it's about how I, I I do that and how do we turn that around into a business uh, outcome. Yeah. And as an indigenous entrepreneur, what's the biggest challenge you face, and how did you overcome it? Well, the biggest the biggest challenge is 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 ourselves, uh, because it's not uh, you know when people look at us and even when we look at ourselves, we don't we, we never saw ourselves as business. And, uh, and yet, uh, you know, if you're really about self-determination, you're really about building a future for your people, then it is about uh, having uh, business because we know that Australia and, and most countries in the world, are, you know, the people who pay the bills are the business community. They're the ones who hire people, give people jobs. You know, that was one of the missing links. We always talked about employment, but you can't have employment unless you have a business that actually makes money and, and hires people, and that gives employment for people. So, so changing that mindset because that you know we were more community based. Uh, we, this idea of profit making and all this type of thing was not necessarily uh, what we looked at. So, so breaking out of that. So it took me. You know, a while to do that. You know, five, six years, and going away and studying and reading and looking at things and how that happens and that. So, and I continually do that. I'm, I'm always learning something new every day. Never think that you know everything, and you uh, and you and you don't have to learn anything anymore. I'm always learning something, uh, so that's important. And so that was my biggest challenge, and I think it's the biggest challenge for Indigenous people. In fact, it's it's really amazing how it's changed. If we're talking about business and stuff like that. 50, 15 years ago, people would have looked at you and said, well, why are Indigenous people doing this? And even Indigenous people would say that. That's not our area. But now everyone's out there. The growth of it is just amazing. You know, we look at what the IPP policy has done and how that's grown. And there's a lot of other opportunities out there. Uh, you know, every time I see that the government put out a budget, every time I see... I read the newspapers, even if uh, if it's good or bad news, there's still opportunities. You know, like, for instance, when we did the, re the rehab, the regeneration, that was a downturn in the mining, uh, uh, but it was also an upturn in mining rehab, and so we took that advantage. Yeah. And um, what advice would you give an aspiring Indigenous entrepreneur who is uncertain about what to do to get into business and get their idea up and going? Well, the thing is have confidence in your idea. Uh, uh, you know, research it, kick it around, beat it with a stick. Uh, have confidence. Have confidence in yourself. Don't don't be shy about coming forward and talking about your business and talking about your ideas and getting out there. Uh, you know, this is one of the things I I, I love at the moment within uh, Indigenous business people is that there the people I meet today, so young people I meet today, are, are not shy about coming forward, not shy about putting their ideas out there. Uh, they're just so articulate and really good movers and groovers. Look, I, I look at them and say they're ten times better than, than what I was at their age. And and this is what we've got to do. We've got to build a, a people who have self-belief, confidence, achievers, and able to sell a deal. And don't be, and don't be nervous about that. And what's the difference um, in your mind between an entrepreneur and an employee? Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a huge difference. An entrepreneur is a person with a vision. They can walk into any place and look around within in five minutes. They could pick out opportunities and things that can be done that you could turn into a business. Uh, an, uh, an employee is a person who, who's really brought on board uh, to do um, to do certain jobs and do certain things. That's not to say that some employees don't have that I, that vision as well. But the entrepreneur is a different area. An entrepreneur is a person who really shakes up things and makes a massive diff difference. In fact, if it wasn't for the entrepreneur, we wouldn't be in the technology age that we're in. And that's across all sectors. That's across in health, in regard to to surgery and, and medicines. Um, in regard into engineering and in industry and in infrastructure, uh, you look at the incredible stuff that uh, the entrepreneur has done and the, and the visions that they have that's driven, you know, made the world a better place. And what's the biggest change you've noticed within the Indigenous business sector and where do you see it progressing in the future? I think the biggest change is, is that people are, uh, you know, that it, there's self confidence about themselves, this, this uh, belief. That they can move and shake and change, uh, not only their own 
themselves, but uh, and benefits for themselves and family, but also for their communities and for for Australia. Because if we get more Indigenous people into business and driving things, that's a, that's a better outcome for Australia. But also through through these uh, through their work, they can actually change the world. Yeah. And talking about the world, um, which country or organisation um, do you believe is leading the charge in Indigenous entrepreneurship and economic development? And how can Australia's government and corporates learn from their success? Look, we normally look over, when we look at things, we look at Canada and the United States and New Zealand and stuff like that. I believe that uh, from my um, uh, conversations and, and talking with people and uh, and looking around the world, I reckon in the last few years Australia's gotten ahead of that market now. Uh, you know, really incredible policies like the Indigenous procurement policy, which i got to say is the best government policy ever created in this space because for very little money, because they were going to give out contracts anyway, they've created an amazing marketplace. It's something over $300 million now. The predictions, it'll go up to over a billion dollars. But when you put in the private sector and other state and territory governments, that's going to be several billion dollars. And, uh, and then you look at uh, that's annually, and then you start looking at then we going into other marketplaces like Southeast Asia, which is the largest growing economy in the world at the moment. Uh, then, uh, then that we're sitting at, at the cutting edge of that to uh, be able to contribute and, and do some really fantastic things. So I reckon Australia is now starting to move very quickly ahead. Definitely, and I agree. Um, just with the IPP, obviously it's made a, a massive difference, positive difference within the community, um, but there might be a few challenges at the moment um, with it actually getting um, having a positive impact uh, on the ground level. Are you able to expand on you know some of the possible issues with the IPP? Well, the, the biggest issue, of course, is the management of it. We've got to ensure that, uh, that the company, you know, it's going to the right companies. It's going to, uh, uh, you know, the people talk about black cat cladding and things like that. We've got to ensure that it is their indigenous businesses that, that are that are benefiting from that. Also, in the in the longer term, we've got to look about um, uh, how that affects indigenous employment as well to ensure that there is a flow down effect. Now that yeah, we have we have so we, at the top end we have commercial profit making businesses who are selling incredible products and doing incredible work. At the same time, at the other end, we're, we're employing Indigenous people and building their capacities also to, to, to be in the commercial business uh, marketplace and also building good financial and entrepreneurial approaches. Perfect. And is there one or three business apps or tools that have added tremendous value to you that you could share with the entrepreneurial listeners? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question because uh, I'm a bit of a, I'm an old-fashioned type guy. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not, I do enjoy some apps and stuff like that. But uh, my main thing is, uh, uh, you know, that is the new world. Uh, technology and the access of technology uh, is going to, is just going to drive, you know, the next, you know, if you can't even predict what's going to be around in five years' time. Uh, what's 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 happening and, and what's going on? I just um, uh, you know you look at uh, I like disruptive thinking. I'm a great believer in disruptive thinking. So you, you take things that come from the side and smash through and, and make a big difference in that. And this is where the apps and uh, you know you look at Uber for instance, how that's been disruptive in what in a benef beneficial way. It's taken an old industry and created a whole new world of industry. And then you're starting to get a whole a whole heap of other things that are coming out of that. The things I see, the great opportunities, is it doesn't really matter where you are living now or conducting your business. It's now a global marketplace. So you could be sitting at the back of Burke, you set up your, 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 you know, your, your website, you set up your businesses, uh, you set up your apps and you get them out there and you'll be surprised about where you, where that will go. That automatically opens you up to a global marketplace. Yeah. And so with the apps, um, could you recommend one or three helpful books instead for Indigenous entrepreneurs? Ah, books. <laughs> <laughs> Hard copies. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, the best book I've read is, is a thing called, is called uh, Why Nations Fail. And this is one of the things that it was given to me by uh, a friend of mine, Brian Hartzer, who's the, uh, the CEO of Westpac Bank, 
he said, Warren, you will find this fascinating. And it's by uh, two economists from um, uh, the uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, so very high, very well uh, PhD economists. But they write in a very simple language because the economics can bore you to death. And they actually go through 2,000 years of history and they see about how you create the space, the environment for ideas to flourish. And those ideas then turn into commercial business opportunities and they drive, they drive economies. So it's really the, the book's name is Why Nations Fail, but it should be about why nations succeed. And it actually talks about the, the environment and the culture that you've got to create that, uh, that encourages and develops thinking and challenges and people being disruptive. I need to read that book. Mm. So thanks, Warren, um, for giving up your valuable time and insights and, and inspiring other Indigenous entrepreneurs to get into business and become successful to help themselves and help their communities. Okay, thank you very much. This was the Indigipreneur Podcast, an Indigenous entrepreneurship and economic development podcast which aims to promote positive change within Indigenous communities. 